I have three things in my hand, I'm not sure. <laughs> Good morning. Um, again, my name is uh, Jay Kumar from uh, US Army TARDEC. I'm a research engineer at TARDEC. So I'm going to introduce the case study and let the actual workers, the researchers, uh, present their results. So the, um, the emphasis from the Army and from DOD is to make the vehicles uh, fully autonomous. Uh, that is the vision and, uh, and the eventual goal. The Army wants to be at this end of the spectrum where the autonomy varies from all the way from pure teleoperation, there's no uh, autonomy at all, but it's fully uh, human controlled uh, remotely, and all the way it goes all the way up to the full autonomy where there's no human involved at all. So this is the vision or the goal, end goal for the Army, but the autonomy spectrum, as I said, can range from this end to the other end and everywhere in between. So if even though we want to be here, the reality is somewhere in between below that level for a long time to come. That means there's going to be a collaboration between a human and a machine or the uh, autonomy for a long time. So to understand this uh, space, you really need to understand each one of them individually as well. So not, not just knowing the collaboration between the operator, the remote operator and the autonomous algorithm, but also you need to understand individually what they mean so that when you c combine or collaborate, you can understand the uh, interaction between the two and the effect effective performance. Okay. So wh what does that mean as far as mobility is concerned is that when there is no autonomy, only the driver, remote driver involved or in fully autonomous or a combination, how that affects the mobility performance of the vehicle at the, in the whole spectrum. That is the interest of, for this case study. So what we are looking at, what you're going to hear from all the presentations uh, coming after the introduction, is going to look at how the vehicle mobility performance varies in the entire spectrum, going from the teleoperation to full autonomy, because even though we might end up here in a long, for a long term, the individual performance from the entire spectrum is important for us to understand so that uh, in the combination, we will also know how that uh, influences the effective outcome. Now, since, as I said, that uh, the entire spectrum is important, not just the uh, eventual outcome, so we're going to look at, in the teleoperation range, how the latencies or the delays matters in the mobility performance. It's a very uh, well-known fact that the communication between the operator, uh, the remote operator and the vehicle back and forth, and the delays in the communication affects very adversely in the mobility performance. You either cannot keep up with uh, uh, your intended path, or you, you cannot really go fast as much as you would like to go. So if you're driving, sitting in the vehicle and able to drive, it's often because of the situ lack of situational awareness, or, um, uh, the communication network issues, we often find the teleoperation is quite inferior, even though what you saw in Dr. Gorsuch's slide, when everything is ideal, you can really beat the driver sitting on the vehicle. But that's not really the case uh, in, uh, in real situation. So because of those limitations, the speed is very hampered, that the mobility is hampered. So the goal is to make the teleoperation uh, go fast as we can. And so the, this project is going to, the project that we are going to talk about here is to accomplish high speed in the presence of uh, latencies or the delays in the system or the network. The next one is in the semi-autonomous region where it's a combination of the collaboration between the remote operator and the autonomous algorithm is taking place. So we're look, looking at different aspects of the semi-autonomy. In one hand, there has to be a decision made how the control between the operator and the algorithm uh, works and what would be the best uh, collaborative opportunity between the two so that the eventual mobility outcome is the best. So this project looks at the first project or the project number two looks at the haptic feedback from the system so that the operator and the algorithm can decide what's the optimal combination so that the performance will be the best. Now. As I said, the eventual outcome what the, where the Army wants to go or, or the intended goal is going to be fully autonomous. What that also means, 
going from the left to the right, we expect the mobility performance is going to be better. That is, with the reduced involvement of the human and letting the machine handle more and more, the performance is expected to be better. So the project number three is looking at how uh, to demonstrate uh, shared control with increased autonomy and less of a human involvement really makes mobility better. Now, the R case are modeling and simulation based and knowing that all of this involve a human, to generate results, you are relying on human-based experiments. And that comes with a lot of limitations. You have to find the human operators, and you have to design the system and collect data. So this la last, uh, the project number four looks at, if you take the human out and actually replace the human with a cognitive model, can you generate all those results by purely a modeling and simulation-based approach that doesn't rely on a real human? Uh, I don't mean between real and fake human. There is just take the human out and use a model-based human in the system to generate the same uh, results that you can generate from any one of these simulations. Now we are actually here in the, the dreamland where we want to be everything fully autonomous. Now, even though you would believe that the, uh, I mean, Google is driving on a fully autonomous land, but there's a lot of uncertainties and a lot of uh, issues when it comes to military vehicles. The, the vehicles are not small. We are looking at not like packbots, but large vehicles like Humvees and Strikers, and where the dynamics is, uh, plays a significant role, that in fact, they limit the performance. You cannot, these are large vehicles with high center of gravities, and you cannot go fast and turn fast either simultaneously. So the stability of the vehicle under uh, extreme uh, dynamic conditions limit the amount of performance you can get from a mobility perspective. So what we are looking at is looking at the existing path, path planning algorithms and how we can incorporate the dynamics aspects so that the resulting uh, recommended paths and uh, paths can be stable. That, uh, uh, in terms of avoiding obstacles and unstructured payments, uh, unstructured environments that you are able to maneuver through safely without uh, compromising on your mobility performance in terms of speed uh, and uh, path following, etc. The last aspect is um, there's always an issue when it comes to autonomous simulations, the fidelity of the models that you would be using. And it's always a compromise made that to make the model simpler so that you can run fast and often in real time. What happens is, I like to say, is mostly the video game industry taking over the MNS when it comes to autonomous simulations. That's anything that you see is believable, which is not really true. So this project looks at what is the trade-off between the model fidelity that you need versus the computational efficiency or the price to pay. Now, I have to say that even though it looks like you had to trade off to get the, uh, the speed that you want, but I think the compute power is increasing on a daily basis, that you can afford to have high fidelity at the same time able to use the highest power computational, uh, uh, computational power that you need and without having to compromise uh, um, unnecessarily. Now, all of this deals with um, various model, modeling methods, uh, different algorithms, and um, simulations, and also experiments in the, in, in the sense of um, man-in-the-loop simulations, as well as hard, hardware platforms. For example, this haptic feedback is going to be demonstrated by we're using a mini Baja. I think, I hope you would see it uh, during the break outside. Um, and, uh, so it, it's not just a pure modeling and simulation as I said, it involves modeling, algorithms, simulations, as well as uh, um, platforms, uh, based demonstrations, uh, and man-in-the-loop simulations too. So as you see in the bottom, the various platforms are being used uh, in, in throughout. So this is the uh, schematic of the systems uh, that we've been modeling. And, uh, you, you can see the remote operator, the autonomous algorithm, and the vehicle in, uh, interacting with the environment. And as, as I finished the introduction, the, each presenter will uh, point to where they are on this uh, space and how it invo uh, affects the mobility from a, an autonomy perspective. So with that said, I'll uh, invite uh, Ying Shi Sheng to talk about the um, 
the uh, pure teleoperation and how the speed, uh, you can have a high speed teleop in, in the presence of uh, um, delays or latencies. Okay, thank you, Dr. J. As mentioned before, communication delays negatively affect the vehicle mobilities. So this, this, in this part, we're focusing on using predictors to compensate communication delays in high-speed teleoperated vehicles. Ideally, without any delays, the system is shown here. So based on the updated information of vehicle speed, global positions, and heading angles, the view of the environment and the, all the vehicle informations displayed to the human drivers are updated in this virtual interface. Human drivers look at the interface and using steering wheels and pedals to control the vehicles by applying the throttle, brake, and steering command. Here, the vehicle model is a notional Hong V. But in, actually, there, in the actual teleoperator settings, there exist control delays and sensor delays uh, between the onboard and the offboard. So as mentioned before, delays with delays, vehicle is hard to control. So to compensate those delays, we're introducing new predictors. So based on the uh, delayed information and their derivatives, the predictors aims to predict the undelayed signals at the current times. The predicted output X1 hat and X2 hat are the human control commands and the vehicle response signals as mentioned before. So each predictors have the same st structures. They are governed by very simple dynamics. Uh, specifically, predictors are our first order time delay systems. There are three important things to highlight here. Uh, the predictors have only one design parameter lambda to <coughs> turn, and the range of lambda that ensures uh, stable predictors is only a function of time delay, and they're not related to the system of either the driver or the vehicles. And as a result of that, the whole predictors do not need to know the system information of the driver or the vehicle system. Thus, we are referring these predictors as the model-free predictors. So to quantify the predictor's performance, a human-in-the-loop test was performed. During the test, human drivers <coughs> sit in front of the computers, look at the virtual interface. The steering, uh, rotating the steering wheels and pressing the pedals to control the steering and the speed. Uh, three cases will be performed here. The ideal case without any delays, the delayed cases with 900 milliseconds of round trip delays, and the predictor cases with the same amount of delay but with delay compensations. Each driver drive, five, uh, five drivers drive each cases seven times and the order of the cases are randomized to reduce the human learning effect. And also, there will be a demo outside the corridors during coffee break. Uh, a notional Humvee, uh, a track with center line and other landmarks are animated in this virtual environment. And uh, the human drivers are instructed to complete this track and uh, drive the vehicles as close to the center line and as fast as possible. This video shows a uh, comparison of vehicle performance under all, delay uh, under all cases. So the vehicle with the same color is stands for the ideal cases, and the, the vehicle with the blue color stands for the delay cases, and the vehicle with the tan color stands for the predicted cases. And in the delay cases, we can see that the vehicle is hard to control and goes out of the track more often. It also took more time to complete the track, and the arrow to the center line is the greatest one. And the predictor cases seems to lead to better performance. So these are the test results for all driver status. Uh, again, three cases with the same color representations as shown in the videos are compared. A three performance matrix are being studied here. The track completion time, the L2 norm of the lane keeping arrows, and the steering control effort. Normalizing the delay and the predictor case with respect to the ideal case and using analysis of variance, we indicate that there is a significant difference in mean between all cases, as marked by the asteroid here. Are those bars uh, standard, one standard deviation or two standard deviation? Yes, it's one standard deviation. One standard deviation. And the predictor cases reduce the track completion time by 29%, and the, 
the lane keeping error by 46% and the steering control effort by 47%. And thus, predictors are capable of significantly improving the vehicle mobilities. So to sum up, in this part, the predictors can compensate communication delays and significantly improving the vehicle mobilities in high-speed teleoperative vehicles. Next, we'll move on to the semi-autonomous spectrum, and then Mr. Paul Bone will talk about using haptic feedback for decision making. Thank you, Yingxi. Um, so, as he said, we're going to move along the autonomous spectrum and introduce some autonomy in a control architecture, um, which is a haptic parallel control architecture. Oh, it is playing. Wonderful. Okay, so. Um, what we did is we took one of the Baja racing cars and we made it remote control. Um, but we didn't do it like just any remote control. We did it such that we have a pretty torquey motor with low inertia and we have a low mechanical advantage here so the human on board can actually back drive the motor and steer at the same time um, that the motor or automation would be able to do that. Um, then we have it linked up with a radio link over to an off-board station. Um, so that someone offboard the vehicle can control it at the same time. That's Frank. Um, you'll see him throughout the videos. And then this is our offboard station, and we have the radio connection on the other side. And then we have a, a similar setup to it's actually basically identical to the one on the car with the the motor and the um, belt drive to the steering wheel. So. What we did with this is we created a virtual link. So the offboard and onboard wheels um, are linked. You see as Frank turns one steering wheel, the steering wheel on the car moves, and then I can turn the wheel the other way, and then the offboard wheel moves. And we can actually feel what each other are doing um, on the wheel as we move it um, back and forth, as you see here. So then we took it off-road, or not off-road, on-road, rather. Um, we put it on the road. I'm hanging on the side there because the batteries are in the seat. Um, <laughs> this was fun. <laughs> so you can actually see that um, the, the steering wheel is linked, so I'm not touching the steering wheel. And Frank's able to steer the steering wheel on the car. So you can think of me maybe as, a, as an autonomy that right now doesn't need to do anything because uh, Frank's doing a good enough job driving, so he's just going to let me, um, I'm just going to let him, him steer the wheel like that. Um, but we'll show an application here. Um, with lane keeping, um, we went on the dyad, and um, so he's doing a bad job driving, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> but he's going to go off, and now the automation's going to kick in. Watch that steering wheel there. See, that's not him turning, that's the automation, and he can feel the effect there on the steering wheel as he's about to leave. It, it cuts back and keeps trying to go up the lane, but I don't let him. So, uh, And then we did another one with obstacle avoidance. Um, so Frank here is um, going to try to drive me into a tree, <laughs> and he's going to go for it. But at the last minute, I'm going to pull out his automation system. And you can see on Frank's wheel, you see his wheel, it, it kicks back. And then he's going to try to run me into a light post. Um, that's not going to work either. So anyway, um, come see the demo that we have outside um, during the break. And Next will be um, Justin um, with talking about another control architecture. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Paul. Um, as Paul described, their work focuses or their demo focus on communication between human and automation where each entity exchanges its information using haptics. The project that I'll be talking about today also focuses on this communication between human and automation. In my case, the human passes control inputs to the automation, as shown in the diagram on this screen, and then the automation and vehicle both communicate information back to the human using a visual display. Over the course of this case study presentation, you'll notice we're considering increasing levels of intelligence on board the UGV. In my particular project, we assume that the vehicle has some ability to sense and detect obstacles However, it's not intelligent enough to complete the mission completely autonomously. That is, we require some input from the human operator in order to successfully complete the mission. We recently conducted a human subject study where we had users teleoperate a simulated robot in Anvil 
and we had different test conditions of communication delay, and we had different levels of plane teleoperation and a semi-autonomous control method that we've developed. I'll use the human subject study we completed to try and describe to you how our semi-autonomous control method works. But first, I'll give you an overview of what the plane teleoperation scenario looked like. The human operator gave inputs to the robot using an Xbox gamepad controller, as you see in the bottom left corner. From these inputs of speed and turning, there was a path that the robot was projected to follow using blue lines overlaid on the robot's camera view. As you can see in the bottom right picture, uh, based on the current inputs, we predict that the human operator is going to collide with this orange traffic coming straight ahead. With the semi-autonomous mode, the human interacted with the system in a very similar way. They provided inputs of speed and turning. However, instead of these inputs being passed directly to the robot, they were passed to our semi-autonomous controller, which used model predictive control to match the human input as closely as possible without violating constraints. The constraints we imposed included avoiding collisions with obstacles and obeying the dynamic equations of motion of our robot. In the bottom right plot, you can see the red dashed lines are the path that the robot would follow if it listened to the human's input completely. But as we can see, this would cause a collision with the orange traffic cone. So the information displayed to the user was only this blue path with the, that the semi-autonomy calculated to move the robot on the right side of the obstacle. The video that's playing here is what the human subjects experienced during a trial of the user study. So they were, human subjects were asked to drive around in an environment filled with obstacles and cover as much area as they could while avoiding collisions. There was a uh, communication delay in between the inputs the human gave to the controller and what the robot actually received, as well as communication delay in the camera feed that was sent back to the user. Um, in, this, in, in this presentation, I'll discuss just <coughs> one of the performance metrics that we looked at and that was one of the average forward speed that human operators were able to move the robot. So on this slide, the top two plots represent um, the low delay of 400 milliseconds and the high delay of 800 milliseconds for the teleoperation control mode. And the bottom plot represents these same two delays but with the semi-autonomous control mode. So overall, we can see that the increased latency results in decreased uh, speed that human operators can drive. And I've rearranged the box plots from the previous slide to this arrangement on this one to compare the teleoperation and semi-autonomous modes. The top plot compares the two for the low latency of 400 milliseconds, and we see a relatively modest increase in forward speed of 14%. At the higher communication latency, we see a larger increase in the speed that people could drive of 38%. We found similar trends with the other performance metrics we looked at, which included the percent of area that people covered, as well as the number of collisions but I won't share those plots uh, in this presentation. They'll be on my poster if you're interested. Overall, we found that communication, um, negative, or communication latency negatively impacted our human operator's performance, and semi-autonomy was able to help, and the improvements that we saw with the semi-autonomy were more pronounced at the higher communication latencies. In the next presentation, I'll hand it over to Dr. James Soplowski, who will be outlining his efforts in human cognitive modeling for a similar semi-autonomous framework. Thank you, Justin. The motivation for this project is that it would be advantageous if we could to perform simulated shared control experiments without always having an actual human available for testing. In order to do that, we would need a digital proxy for, hum for a human. Therefore, this project has been investigating the incorporation of what is called a driver cognitive model into a larger shared control simulation in order to see if it can perform um, and effectively represent the human driving capability as well as then use it to, um, uh, let's see, to uh, investigate the um, performance of a shared control um, algorithm. All right. The driver cognitive model is visually based and is written in ACTOR, which stands for Adaptive Control of Thought Rational. ACTOR is a very high-level computational model of human cognition as opposed to low-level models such as um, ones that are based on neural networks. The ACTOR driver model itself was developed at Drexel University and models the sensory motor performance of a human driving on a freeway. Now, for this case study, we have adapted it 
in order to have it simulate the human tall operation performance at various latencies following a prescribed path. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of time to describe in detail how the cognitive model works. But the um, short version is that it maps um, the di differences between the distance and angles between a point, a visual point right in front of the vehicle and a further point uh, further away, which is the goal point that the, this, the driver is trying to drive to. And it maps those into control outputs, throttle and steering. One more point I want to make, there's actually a parameter called time headway, which controls the distance away of that goal point. And for the purposes of this model, it simulates how aggressively the model is going to try to drive the path that it's being told to follow. All right, so we came up with this scenario in, on this page in order to try to validate the, the cognitive model against actual human performance. So what we're going to have to have it do is the driver cognitive model is going to attempt to drive the path on the right at a constant speed of 20 meters per second. It's a notional Humvee. And so we're going to do the tests at for three different levels of latency, 0, 350 milliseconds, and 700 milliseconds. Now the human data is provided by Mr. Yun Ji Zhang, who spoke first in this um, presentation. Um, what he did is he drove eight runs of the same exact course at the three different latency cases. So next slide, we're going to compare the results. So this slide shows the path following results for the driver cognitive model as well as the human data. Now the model result is the result of varying that aggressiveness parameter, so, so how, how aggressively the model is going to try to drive the path. We found the minimum, the value at which the minimum error occurred, and, and that's what the, um, uh, the cognitive model result is. Now for the human case, it's just the average of the eight runs that were run at each latency, and these are single, well, standard deviation, that was one standard deviation error bars on the human results. Now you can see at zero latency, there's quite a bit of difference between the, what the, the performance of the cognitive model could do versus the human. But this difference is like the result of the human subject, Mr. Zhang himself, having a lot of knowledge about the actual path um, track he was driving because he's the one who designed it and he had done it a lot. But that benefit decreases as latency increases. And you can see that for the next two varied levels of latency, we can see that both the model and the human performance decrease because they have more path following error, and that the agreement between the model and human performance um, is getting better than it was at the first um, for the zero latency case. So once it appeared that the driver cognitive model gave the right sort of trends in human performance as a function of latency, we decided to investigate, use it to investigate how a proportional shared control algorithm um, works. And we'll describe that in the next slide. Now in the interest of time, we're only going to show the results of a single scenario for the shared control case. Um, it involves two obstacles as shown. Oops. So in this case, the driver cognitive model is going to attempt to drive the blue path um, at, three, at, um, at uh, a particular set of latencies. Um, okay. The next slide, this slide shows the particular shared control algorithm that we implemented, which was developed at MIT. In this case, both a human, or in our case, it's a simulated human, and an autonomous algorithm. In our case, the autonomous algorithm that was developed by Mr. Ji Chao Lu, who will speak next, are both providing a continuous set of inputs to the vehicle. And they are being shared, I mean, they are being um, proportionally combined according to a value k, a proportionality constant k. This proportionality constant um, is a function of what we call a threat metric. An example of the threat metric function is down here at the bottom right. Now, with the, in this case, the threat metric that we're using is this, the magnitude of the front wheel slip angle. And we're using this as a proxy for what the actual current uh, stability situation of the vehicle is. So as the threat value goes up, we're perceiving that the, uh, the um, vehicle is less stable and therefore the shared control will kick in more. So at a value of k equals 1, the vehicle is being fully autonomous. All right, so in this case what we did is we um, showed the path following results for a case where the sensing and control latencies were both 350 milliseconds. What we did is then we ran simulations with the driver cognitive model at different levels of aggressiveness again, both with and without the shared control algorithm on. So at the most aggressive setting here, which is number one, you can see that the, the simulated human cannot complete the course successfully. In this case, it's because you get tire lift off. And also the shared control, even with shared control on, the path cannot be completed for the same reason. 
the next two levels of driver aggressiveness, the driver still can't complete the course successfully by themselves, but in this case, with the shared control on, the vehicle, the course can be successfully completed, and each time the, error, the overall path error is being decreased. And finally, for the ways you um, decrease the aggressiveness of the driver model more, eventually it can, the, the human, simulated human can finally complete the course successfully by themselves. But even in this case, you can see that the shared control algorithm being on improves the path following performance. So in summary, this, uh, this um, project has shown that the cognitive model that we've incorporated seems to be able to produce the representative human path following performance of proper trends of function of latency. And also that the thread-based shared control um, uh, algorithm can perform, improve on human performance. Next um, up, coming up will be Mr. G. Chao Lu, who will describe his obstacle avoidance for large vehicles at high speeds. Thank you, James. Uh, so my part of presentation will cover the obstacle avoidance algorithm for fully autonomous vehicles that James leveraged. So different from previous uh, efforts, human is not involved in the framework. Control commands for the vehicle are completely from the uh, automation unit. So this algorithm is developed for large autonomous ground vehicles at high speed, where it is critical to take into account vehicle dynamic related constraints. Otherwise, severe obstacle avoidance maneuver may induce uh, stability issues such as tire lift off or uh, roll over. Next, I'll describe the automation unit in detail. So in order to have the autonomous ground the vehicle to pass through a pre-specified goal position from its initial position in an unknown environment, uh, we propose a model predict control-based obstacle <coughs> avoidance algorithm. A LiDAR sensor is used to obtain obstacle information from the environment, where it returns distance to the closest obstacle boundary in each radial direction. Using the LiDAR data, an area that free from obstacle can be uh, formed and we partition the safe region into triangles and sectors so that we can have analytical representations of the area for future use. So with the interpreted obstacle information and uh, task requirements, we can formulate an opt optimal control problem that aims to navigate the vehicle through the obstacle field with the minim minimum amount of time. And uh, in, the in the optimal control problem formulation, we are taking the vehicle dynamic into account. In particular, uh, the vehicle states are predicted using a three deg degree of freedom vehicle model, taking into account uh, vehicle longitudinal load lo transfer and tire nonlinearity. Our study have indicated that this uh, combination best balance the accuracy and uh, precision, accuracy and efficiency. The vehicle acceleration and deceleration capabilities from the powertrain and brake dynamics are also accounted for. And the last, to ensure the vehicle dynamical safety in terms of no tire liftoff, the vehicle states are constrained within a region shown as the steering capability that takes into account the lateral load transfers. The formulated optimal control problem is solved uh, using the pseudo-spectral method and the interior point method that generates the uh, optimal steering braking throttle commands that is sent to the vehicle at each time step, and this loop will continue until the task is completed. Next, let's look at one set of uh, simulation. This uh, is a vehicle navigating within a complex environment that consists of obstacles of different sizes. The, the left animation shows the overall view, and the pink lines are uh, safe regions from the LiDAR data. The right animation on the right side is a uh, local view, where the blue areas indicating the vehicle tire vertical loads. And as you can see, this is a snapshot of the vehicle performing a severe maneuver. The rear left tire has a small tire vert small vertical load, but st it still maintains contact with the ground. Thus, we are uh, pushing the vehicle to the limit, but still maintains dynamical safety. This scenario is a vehicle maneuvering in a structured environment on hard surface. We also consider a scenario where the vehicle moves on soft terrain. This video is a close-up view. Due to the reduced maneuverability, on a soft soil, the vehicle cannot travel as fast as when it is on a hard surface, 
And as you can see in the video, the uh, tire sinkage is also accounting for in our controller. The video on the bottom shows the vehicle navigated by the algorithm in a structured environment where the obstacle arrangement mimics the double lane change scenario. So in summary, we have an obstacle avoidance algorithm developed for large autonomous ground vehicles at high speed. It is capable of avoiding obstacles and uh, ensuring uh, dynamical safety. And uh, next, uh, Dr. Uh, Poplovsky will talk about the trade-off in vehicle dynamics in the simulation-based study. Thank you, Anji Chao. This next work was um, performed at Tardec by um, Mr. J. Ramalingam, uh, but he couldn't be here today, so he asked me if I could present it um, for him. So when using simulation and development of and validation of autonomous navigation algorithms or vehicle algorithms, the accuracy of the vehicle model as well as um, its performance are key aspects. The objective of this project was in order to evaluate the role of model fidelity, uh, performance accuracy, and computational efficiency. Two plant models were evaluated of an Oceanal Humvee. One of them was a 102 degree freedom model um, constructed in the commercial package Adams. Another one was a 14 degree of freedom model which was, which was built in MATLAB. The parameters of the MATLAB model were derived from the Adams model and therefore was meant to rep be representative of that. The plant models were evaluated using various um, uh, simulation scenarios. These include simple straight line run, step steer, or constant radius turns, as well as some obstacle avoidance courses. And these uh, results from these are going to be compared by looking at the vehicle pass, um, lateral acceleration, tire forces, and whether the target was actually reached. In the Cal cases, the plant models are run at a constant speed of 20 meters per second. Now here for the constant radius cornering maneuver, we can see that um, the, 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 the models were given a fixed angle to steer at and didn't complete a complete circle. Now you can see on the right, right, right left hand side here, which is the, the actual path, you can see that the actual paths followed are clearly different. On the right hand side, we can see that the tire forces are also significantly different. Um, the, for the 14 degree of freedom model, for almost the whole maneuver, the wheel, the wheel is very near tire liftoff, whereas the higher degree of freedom model is showing that it's not, uh, not, not as near. Next, um, both plat models were run through uh, these a couple of different obstacle avoidance um, scenarios, as you can see here. Um, in all cases, they were being um, controlled by the autonomous navigation algorithm that Mr. G. Chao Liu just described. The vehicles will drive at a constant speed of 20 meters per second from the start to the end, and in order, and also try to avoid the obstacles, obviously. Now here we're going to see some paths um, for uh, these obstacle cases that were run with the latencies which are shown here. I would note that the autonomous algorithm that Mr. Liu described can compensate for latencies if they are known or can be estimated, but in these tests, the, the, the latencies were not compensated for. In these cases, while both plant models were able to um, successfully reach the end, you can once again clearly see that there are path differences. Now, a, a second example of the, of the two obstacle case shows what the possible end effect can be of having different um, uh, path, uh, paths or uh, performance, even if it's slight. Now in this case, using a larger sensor delay than the previous slide, the vehicle paths of the two plants are so different in this case that the 14 degree of freedom model um, cannot successfully complete the, uh, the maneuver to get to the target. And what it wanted to do is it decided it was going to try to go around, but then it, because of the uncompensated latencies, it still ended up running into the um, obstacle. Whereas the, the, mo the model run with the higher um, order model was able to successfully um, navigate through the, the, uh, the obstacles and get to the end. Now regarding computational efficiency, both plant models were run, in this case, from simulating 50 seconds of the constant radius maneuver. And the data shows that the 14 degree of freedom model ran faster by over an order of magnitude, 18 seconds compared to 257 seconds. And the final column shows um, the performance loss that was resulted when, when um, co-simulation was used in order to use the high performance Adams model along with the um, autonomous navigation algorithm which was running in MATLAB. And you can see that we lose another order, uh, another factor of two in doing the, performing the co-simulation compared to Adams alone, and obviously is much larger now than the MATLAB model. So in summary, the, this effort found that a reduced order model, while much more computationally efficient, can yield this different results than, than a detailed vehicle model. And in some circumstances, these differences can cause the difference in the predicted success of a mission. Um, Therefore, a trade-off of performance accuracy versus computational efficiency needs to be made in order to determine under what circumstances you need a higher order model. 
Next, I would like to invite Dr. Tolga Ursel to summarize and conclude the case study. I just would like to take a couple of minutes to summarize everything we did. Um, as you can see, we have covered a lot of material, and I hope that gives you a good idea about how big this research problem space is. And we try to highlight all the uh, challenges that need to be addressed at various levels of autonomy, and we also try to cover it a little bit. I know it was very high level, but uh, what is the research that's going on in the art to address those challenges? And we are working very closely uh, with our uh, colleagues at Target, um, and I just want to like, highlight that uh, the, the fourth talk and the sixth talk, they were done at Tardec, and we did that in, uh, in close collaboration with them. And we have covered teleoperation, semi-autonomy, fully autonomy. We covered different platforms, ranging from small ground robots like the Superjoy to all the way up to a large uh, vehicle like uh, motion autonomy. <coughs> and in all these scenarios, in all these operating modes, we need to face different challenges and we need to understand what our algorithms are capable of doing at, at all these given levels of autonomy so then we can assess, okay, if I have this much level of autonomy and to, the next, uh, to go to the next level I need to pay this much, how much will that buy me in terms of performance? So that, uh, this case study very well aligns uh, with the needs that Dr. Gorsuch highlighted in his talk. So overall, our research on predictors and shared control algorithms and uh, fully autonomous navigation algorithms uh, help increase uh, the vehicle mobility at those various levels of uh, autonomy we consider. So going back to this picture that we introduced at the beginning, and if we walk through it once again, we consider it a purely teleoperated uh, vehicle and we uh, introduced novel predictor uh, to help improve the performance of high speed teleoperation when there are significant delays. And uh, we saw that uh, performance can be really uh, improved with the help of those predictors. Then we invited you to a demo that will take place outside during the break. You can actually see the vehicle moving the way it was moving. Uh, in the video, and uh, hopefully when that work is complete, we'll be able to demonstrate that haptic feedback can provide better uh, decision-making capability to the remote operator. And then we uh, moved on to a novel semi-autonomy algorithm that uh, balances the control authority between the human and the automation. And again, we demonstrated uh, compared to the fully, uh, purely teleoperated case, when you add the semi-autonomy, you can increase the mobility of the vehicle. And as the delay increases, the more benefits you can get uh, from the semi-autonomy. Then we talked about uh, human uh, operator modeling effort. We leveraged a cognitive model uh, from the literature that has never been tried in the teleoperation setting before and uh, we, we saw some significant potential of that model to represent the uh, human in uh, pure uh, simulation-based uh, studies as well. And then we talked about our uh, automation algorithm and demonstrated how it can help avoiding obstacles fully autonomously at high speeds. And we also investigated the role of model fidelity uh, when it comes to representing the vehicle in a purely simulation-based um, uh, exercise and highlighted the trade-off between uh, the computational time and the accuracy. And we covered a lot of ground with these projects, but that doesn't mean that we are done. That doesn't mean we solved all the problems. We still have a lot of research to do and we look forward to addressing these kind of questions as well. So here I categorize them in two groups. The first one belongs to the algorithms category. We need to understand what our algorithms are capable of doing. What are their benefits? What are their limitations? How can we uh, push their limits? How can we make them perform better? For instance, 
we consider delays in the, throughout the talk, and we only consider constant delays, or about variable delays. We talked about model predictive uh, control algorithms, and we never discussed the problem of what if our models are not that accurate. How can we make our algorithms more robust? So we'll be investigating those kind of questions when it comes to improving our algorithms. And when it comes to the modeling exercises, um, we need to understand when reduced order models are good enough and when we need to switch to higher fidelity models. Obviously, we cannot simulate both of them all the time just to see if the reduced order model is good enough. So how do we know? How can we quantify that this is a scenario where you need to use a higher fidelity model? We talked about modeling the human driver and we saw some uh, difficult cases where you couldn't capture the human performance well because of some learning effects. How can we extend the scope of our algorithms that they, they can capture those kind of effects as well? So there are a lot of questions and we are very excited uh, to address those questions in the future together with our colleagues at Tardec and also very importantly together with our uh, industry quality members. And with that, to conclude this case study with an industry perspective, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Rich Road, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Quantum Signal. And Quantum Signal is the quad member of, of uh, the three art projects that, uh, the core projects that were leveraged today. So without further ado, Rasan Rich. Thank you, Tonga. Before I start, uh, I figured I would just say a little bit. Uh, when I walked in this morning, I had a big smile on my face, you know, in part because it's a pleasure and an honor to work with such a distinguished research group and all, you know, be associated with such great work, uh, in part because I spent about a decade of my life up here on North Campus learning how to be an engineer, but also because the last time I, s I spoke in this auditorium was about four or five years ago to a, a group of entrepreneur budding entrepreneurs, undergraduates, uh, about three or four hundred of them, and I gave a talk about starting quantum and what we do there and stuff. And one of the first questions out of the, out of the gate was from a, a young man who was, who was trying to kind of inquire about, you know, whether there's a lot of stress on families, on your family when you're starting a company. Uh, what came out of the, the young man was, he asked me pretty much straight up, and, and I, I'm totally serious about this. He said, uh, so does your wife still love you? <laughs> and uh, I'm also serious, and do you still sleep in the same bed? And, and, and I, I heard that, and I was just like, wow. I am, you know, no matter what questions I've been asked across many, many talks, I think that that's one that, that definitely uh, sticks in my mind, and it was right here in this auditorium. So, um, but with that, I've been asked here to. Well, that's the answer. <laughs> I'll tell you exactly what I said to the student, which is it depends on the day. So, uh, but uh, but uh, I've been asked to kind of give an industry perspective on these projects and and how it kind of relates to what we do. Um, Probably very few of you have heard of Quantum Signal. We're a small engineering company that spun out of the U of M in 99. We're located in Saline, just a few miles from here. We do a lot of research and product development for a lot of other companies. And so we work for companies large and small and build products on their behalf that they take and usually put their label on and put out into the marketplace uh, where they're experts in, in how it goes out there. So we work in defense, we work in automotive, we work in entertainment, consumer appliances, a lot of different places. Um, we kind of go between, somewhere between, I say the R and the D in quotes there. We do sometimes a lot of research, sometimes a lot of development, and, uh, and kind of everything in between. The mixture of which usually depends on the customer and it depends on the project. Um, one thing that is very common between customers, I'll tell you, is that, um, that our customers are very product focused. And when they put down a budget and a, and a timeline and they want to do something with us, they actually really badly want to see something come out of it that they can do something with. There's a lot of accountability and, and, and hope. They have some requirements that are pretty solid generally. They've got a timeline and, and they, need, they need this product delivered. And I can tell you, you know, from an industry perspective, generally our customers are fairly risk averse. So they're not sending us off with a giant chunk of change and saying, here, go explore these new concepts and come back to us and tell us how it worked out. They want to see a robotic system that works. <laughs> and a good example, as you see there on the left, a picture of a, uh, of a 5,000 pound electric uh, robotic sniper training system that we put together with one of our partners and, and customers and tested out at, at Fort Benning uh, last October. Um, that's a very large robot to try little tricks and traps with and hope that it works. Uh, when we deploy it, it's gotta work. 
So when I talk about risk averse, um, you know, we want to build cutting edge projects. We want to build cutting edge products. Um, you know, how do we get there if, if we're not allowed on our timeline and our budget to really do something wild and crazy and try a new algorithm? Well, that's where I think that collaboration with academia is essential. And I think that the ARC program and what's going on here today is a good example of how small business or companies generally can work with, uh, work with academics to kind of build up and, and, and come up with new ideas and transition those out. So we are working with three different ARC projects here, all along the autonomy line, all along the robotics line. You see here at Dr. Stein, Dr. Ursel, and Dr. Tilbury and their groups, um, somewhere between enhancing teleoperation through shared control, um, looking at the latency effects, looking at all the good things that Tilbury just summarized. These are things that we face on a daily basis at Quantum, developing robotic systems, particularly uh, uh, teleoperated robotic systems. And so it's, it's something that's very near and dear to our hearts and something that we like to work, work on work with these guys on. In terms of collaboration, I mean, I see Quantum Signal as both kind of a beneficiary and a supporter of what's going on in these projects. As far as supporting goes, you know, we, we get together and we collaborate with, with this team. You know, we try to offer our inputs, you know, relevant or perhaps, you know, when I, when I tell goofy stories, not so relevant. Um, we try to give our perspective from industry and what, what it looks like from a product perspective and how it could transition. Um, we support it through working with these guys and using the Anvil modeling and simulation environment and trying to get it to meet their needs. And it's a good two-way there because as users, they provide feedback to us. And as developers, we try to enhance the product uh, so it meets their needs as robotic system uh, engineers and, and researchers. Um, thirdly, things like a UGV-based implementation. So we do a lot of real-world testing with UGVs. The MIT uh, a shared control algorithm that uh, Tolgan and the guy I mentioned here earlier was something that we worked with that group on in terms of testing out in the field on board that uh, X by wire tech Kawasaki Mule. And uh, so we're working with these guys to try to get some of these algorithms on board and do some real world testing. Um, you know, all the stuff that's going on that was described here this morning in the case study has relevance to real world ongoing projects at Quantum Signal and other places. Um, certainly in the robot, mobile robotics space, I mean, it, it goes without saying, everyone in this room is knowledgeable enough to know where all that stuff fits. Um, we end up developing systems that are good for EOD robots, the, the sniper targeting robots, other things um, that, that this stuff could directly apply to. Um, and as well as you can imagine being in commercial industry nowadays with all the talk of autonomous vehicles and Google cars and such, um, we have our designs in the autonomous vehicle space. So the more of this kind of stuff that we can work with and the more new algorithms for shared control and these sort of things that we can work with these guys on to transition, uh, it's a good thing for us and it's a good thing for our customers. So, you know, what do we hope for in terms of, you know, at Quantum Signal uh, in participating in these? Well, beyond just the everyday enrichment of being able to work with an excellent research team and have the back and forth with, with uh, forward-thinking researchers, we hope for technology transition. We hope to be able to take some of these technologies and put them in our customers' products and get them to the next kind of, uh, get them to the next step and be able to overcome their competitors. And we also hope for staffers, honestly. Um, it's very hard to find well-trained, knowledgeable uh, folks to work at your company when you're developing this stuff. And being able to get students straight out of the gate that have worked on these problems, that are knowledgeable about the problem, and not have to train them up from scratch is a big advantage from a commercial perspective. Um, we've got projects right now that if we had you know, people we could drop right on that were knowledgeable, we'd drop them on today. And so it's really great to be able to work with these students, the very smart students, and, uh, and see what's happening and hope that you know, we can entice them to come to the dark side afterwards. Um, but, uh, but that's pretty much all I had to say. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you here today and to work with this great research team and, and the University in Tardac. They're great collaborators, and uh, thank you very much. As people are starting to recognize that you can actually place yourself in a computer-generated world and interact with it in a physical sense, I think this technology is just going to...